Uh, this uh, Birds of a Feather session is hopefully going to be slightly more interactive. Um, and, but what we'll do is we'll just sort of set the stage for what's there. And then um, hopefully we can have some discussion going. My name is Kate Stewart. I am uh, work at the Linux Foundation and I work on embedded, you know, trying to figure out how we can make the embedded projects be dependable. Um, and then my co-presenter, Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm the community manager at the Sun Project. Uh, so we're hoping to sort of, you know, talk a little bit about what, what the various projects are up to and then how, um, and hopefully you've got questions about them or you know of things we don't know. Um, ideally, if we've forgotten something or you see a problem, please let us know. And that's what we're hoping to get out of this session. So with that starting, um, so these are the open source projects I'm aware of that are working actively towards um, being part of a, a system with functional safety working on it. Um, and there's work going on to integrate them within Yocto as a framework to make it possible to do reproducibility as well as um, have SBOMs and things like that generated automatically with these projects. So I'm just going to go through Zephyr, Kelly's going to go through Zen, I'll go through Elisa, and then we'll just open it up for questions. So if, you want, if you've got thoughts as you're hearing things, you know, jot them down and we can certainly have an open discussion after that. So when you look at those three projects, it's important to understand that Zen is fairly small, um, Zephyr is fairly small, and then Linux is not. <laughs> Linux is not a small um, project. I think Greg gave you guys some stats this morning. I think 13 million lines of code is what's in my, my head right now. I could be wrong. Um, but the code complexity is obviously a big factor. Uh, on the other hand, Linux has been evolved over 30 years is well deployed across the entire ecosystem, and there has been a lot of testing as it's been going along. And each of these projects is taking a slightly different approach um, to how to work with the functional safety and the, set and the safety standards and specs. Um, Zephyr is, uh, has a safety working group as well as a committee. They're looking at adopting an open source requirements tool called StrictDoc, documenting the requirements there, and then connecting up the code to the, um, basically the requirements to the code to the test through that tool and making that um, possible to start to do an analysis. And then some of the artifacts uh, we're making available to only to the members, um, but everything that's sort of in the code and around the code, including the requirements, is going to be open. Um, Zen is basically looking at Mr. stuff and Kelly will go into a lot more details later. And then, um, on the ELISA project, everything is completely open, and but we're not really going after certification, but what we're trying to do is figure out how to do it and make it visible to people as methodologies for working with the kernel and pulling up the analysis and getting buy-in, that this makes sense. So that's sort of where we're starting from. So for Zephyr, for hands up, who's heard of Zephyr? Oh, a fair number of hands, good. Anyhow, just for those who haven't, it's, just, it's an RTOS that is modular and configurable and is designed to work where Linux is just too big. Linux doesn't get smaller than three meg, this is 10K and up type of deal, or 15K depending on who you talk to. However, we are actually trying to go after supporting a, a vModel compliant development process, the vModel analysis level. And so this is basically coming up with the requirements and then doing the traceability at these different levels, as well as you know, being able to take it back up to validation throughout. So we're trying to figure out how we can actually do this. We're, well, we're, we've got a plan, and we've discussed it with TUSUD at this point in time. We've got basic buy-in that we're going in a direction that probably has a chance of leading, working. And so we're starting to work on this evidence in the open at the moment. This is actually all the safety collateral, including the source code. And we're being very, very, trying to be very transparent as to work in progress, what's visible to who, what's not, and who was the owner. And you'll notice that all the source code is owned by the TSC. So we're working with the upstream community on this project to make sure whatever we do can be applied. Um, and then, so you can you know, look through the slide and you can sort of see the safety committee, uh, which is of members only, but then the safety working group is anyone in the community can show up. And if you have interest, you're welcome to show up to these meetings. Uh, and then, as you say, a lot of this stuff is gonna be public. And otherwise, some of this stuff may go to like, you know, just to the members because quite frankly, the members are the ones that are funding this. 
And so we have to show them some return for being a member. This, it's not cheap to have a functional safety manager hired to work on us, nor is it cheap to go through the certification. And so that's part of why we did the split the way we did in this project. Our certification focus initially, and we'll be showing this in all public with the requirement traceability, is just the initial kernel portion of it. And we will be going after 61508 SIL 3 with the root 3S. And we'll be also, we have the option to uh, do a 262662 certification with the same data that we've been collecting. So we'll probably go in that, probably do both of those at the same time. Um, it, it's, it's some additional tables we have to generate and everything else should be there for it based on the, our discussions with TIV. And right now we're basically putting all our public requirements we've um, derived from the code up into the public through these, um, and working with the strict doc tool. That's the current working plan from the safety group. And so you'll be seeing anyone who's sort of interested can watch and see what's going on or quite frankly join in and help us document requirements. And if you're interested in things outside our initial scope, once you see the path pattern we're using for the scope, feel free to put in the coverage for our new requirements in other parts of the code and their code and the testing for them. Because this now will potentially give us a way we can crowdsource beyond just our kernel scope. So we want to start with this initial scope, show it's possible, and then, oh, I really care about this um, USB driver. Okay, you can go and work through the same methodology to put the USB driver into something that can be analyzed. So we're trying to figure out how to instantiate the uh, pattern and then build from that with this project. And what's happening now there, so the safety queen is the one that does the scope of the certification that we take to the because it involves the money. The committee does things that involve the money and you know are specific to the members. The working group is the safety calls and certifications. Um, they're enabling it, working with the code base, working on the required documentation and evidence, setting the requirement management tooling, and it's open to everyone. And there's a list of the slides at the bottom. There's the, um, anyone's welcome to join that mailing list too and start participating if you're interested in it. With that, there's information in the slides on how you can get engaged. I'll turn over to Kelly. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Kelly. I'm the community manager at the Zen Project. I'm also a part of Zen Server. Uh, so Stand Server, they specialize in server virtualization and they're also one of our advisory mo uh, board members on the project. Um, what does my role involve? So as a community manager, I wear a lot of different hats. So day to day, that can involve anything from conflict resolution to event planning to making sure that everything in the community runs smoothly. So um, some of those include uh, Advocating for the developers and making sure that I give developers a voice and how to elevate and promote the growth of the community. I also work closely with the advisory board members to make sure um, everything that they want in terms of the strategy gets presented in the project as well. So here you can see that there's an image that I've put up. Um, so open source, it can mean different things to different people, but one thing we can agree on is that it's important, but it doesn't mean it's easy. So a lot of the times with my role, it's to reduce those barriers of entry within open source projects. Um, we all want more open source maintainers, but it's not always easy. Um, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that struggles with this. The main aim of my role is to elevate that community. So I want to get more people talking about it and more people working within that project as well. So before I get started, I wanted to read through the SEM project mission statement. So the mission of the SEM project is to advance virtualization technology across a wide range of commercial and open source domains. By providing a powerful and versatile hypervisor, the project aims to enable innovation, scalability, safety, and security in virtualization solutions. Oops, yep, I skipped one. So you might be wondering, what is Zen and what is Zen project? Well, Zen is a type one hypervisor. So it's also known as a bare metal hypervisor and sits directly on top of the hardware. Um, 
some plays a central role in providing isolation between those different software components. A little bit about the history. So CEN has actually been around for 20 years. It started in 2003 at Cambridge University. In 2013, a decade later, it decided to join the Linux Foundation. And CEN um, itself is widely used for safety and security first environments. The flexible architecture itself um, allows for all those different applications and services to coexist on the same hardware. And because it's an open source project, there's a lot of different sections within it, and that's why we have different sub-projects. So the main one being the hypervisor. Um, we also do Windows PV, Zappy, and Automotive as well. Things like uh, x86 and ARM are already supported, and in our community, there's a diverse range of committers and maintainers, some of who are from Amazon, SUSE, and SenServer. Um, I'm just going to run through briefly on the Zen architecture. So how Zen works is that there's DOM0, which is also known as the privileged domain. Um, that is the first to start within the Zen hypervisor. DOM0 then asks Zen um, to create the other VMs as it talks directly to the hardware, and then it allocates resources such as memory. The other VMs don't have access to um, to like the hardware uh, like DOM0 does. And um, what does that mean for security? Well, if someone wanted to exploit, then it makes it a lot more difficult because the way the architecture is set up, it gives it such a strong isolation that if one to, you know, were to fail, you can't jump VNs and it can't get um, exploited as easily. So moving on from this. So to show some of the great work that we've done within the community um, and how far we've come along since the previous slide, this is to show uh, DOM zero list system configuration. So what's different about this one is you'll see that DOM zero is optional and actually all the VMs boot in parallel. Uh, this means a faster boot time, which technically it means you're not waiting around for things to start. And actually it's a lot better for things like embedded systems. Um, in terms of cost savings, you actually save quite a bit in terms of you don't have to get SEND safety certified and DOM0 is optional. There's lots of work being done on this DOM0 list configuration at the moment and the project hopes to uh, bring that more uh, towards the future. So some of the current status. Uh, the community has recently done our 418 release and we've had multiple developers from loads of different companies work on this. So some of the key things that we were able to share in this release were that we've done um, new, we've got a new RISC V port and a new PowerPC port. Uh, the Send GitLab CI was also fastly improved. And for safety, the project has adopted a number of MISRC rules. So again, a heavy emphasis on improving security within the Send hypervisor, and it's already more secure than it um, already is. So Send and safety. So SEN and safety actually work hand in hand. Uh, SEN is chosen for safety uh, because it goes through a rigorous review process. So a lot of the maintainers that are actually in those projects, they're experts in their field and they have a long history within working there. So usually when people choose SEN or talk about SEN, it's known for its maturity and security features. Um, you can also configure it to allow for real-time scheduling of VMs and it allows critical tasks to run in, uh, within time constraints, which is really important if you're talking about safety critical systems. Uh, the project also aims to implement some uh, features that uh, improve real time and reduce interference as well. So for things such as automotive or industrial applications, you need real time capabilities uh, to meet those strict timing requirements. So what are our next steps? Well, for scent and safety, they, because they work hand in hand together, uh, the community is working hard on improving the MISRC rules, and it's a long process, which you can probably all appreciate, but it's a step in the right direction for safety. Uh, some of our project members are actually working on getting SEN cert uh, certified. Um, so in terms of safety certi certified, uh, there's probably a lot of potential there, um, so you can only imagine what it can do. 
It's already adopted in a number of projects. Um, so I've just popped some examples there. And we have a number of different users as well. Uh, more importantly, though, we work closely with the Setha and Elisa project. Uh, so as you can imagine, Send being this hypervisor, if it does get safety certified, that has a lot of potential there for different things like embedded systems. And finally, how do I get involved? Well, first of all, I'd recommend that everyone visit the website. It has a majority of the information there. So mailing lists are the heart of the Zen Project community. A lot of discussion still happens to this day on mailing lists. So I'd recommend if you're not already on it, you can either follow it. We do have a few different channels. If you want to reach developers or people in the community directly, I'd highly recommend you join Matrix. Um, it's free to do so, and we have a few different channels. So Zen Project is mainly for your users. So if you want to play around with Zen or you're getting started, um, go here. Send Dev out. Um, that's everything developer related. So if you're really keen on trying to you know, make a new patch or you've got an idea that you know that you want to suggest, go here. And finally, we are a community, so we have a bit of a social channel for everyone. Um, it's mainly to share news. Uh, if you've got a local meetup or you just want to introduce yourself to the community, feel free to do so here. And LinkedIn, that's our place for key updates. So with our 418 release um, and other things like that, you'll see it on our Send Project blog, but at the same time, you'll also find them on LinkedIn. I have also popped the QR codes above if anyone wanted to directly join. Um, at the same time, I am around today, so if anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn or have a chat, feel free to do so as well. So the next one we're talking about is Elisa. And so um, Elisa sort of has started off with the goal of you know, supporting safety certifications when Linux is in there. And Linux plays a variety of roles. Um, when you look at something, so one of the projects we started looking at was like um, the open APS system. Whereas Linux is running on a Raspberry Pi, its job is to communicate with the hardware, and that's about it. Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with the algorithms and so forth, it's just a substrate. So its actual safety functions is making sure there's a reliable platform for the algorithm to run on. Um, and that you know something hasn't been misconfigured in boot ups and things like that, to where it would be something an integral part of, and then it, you know varies in scale to a whole bunch of places where it could have a lot more impact at the architecture level, and the interference in the memory subsystems and so forth. So we've got a wide range of things that Linux could potentially be used for, and so there is no one size fits all, there is no one safe Linux, because there's so many configurations and each of these configurations makes effectively a different Linux. So we're trying to figure out, okay, what are the processes that, and what's the analysis that people should go through to actually understand, have they done the right level of thinking to figure out if the Linux is gonna be safe? And so we've been meeting and figuring out best practices and trying to understand parts of the kernel and work with the community and the kernel community to improve the documentation of things that are gonna be relevant. And um, like say, figure out techniques that work for understanding how to trace the subsystems and things that the safety assessors are gonna be looking for. So our strategy is to get, do analysis, be able to do open analysis so people can see the methodologies and potentially repeat it. And then making sure that the, like we say, we work with a couple of uh, safety assessor communities that are participating in the meetings and they're giving us feedback as we're going along. Um, and what we're trying to get is things ready for system integrators who are using Linux. So what this looks like in practice is like we've got an automotive use case, which is working with the AGL ecosystem. There's a medical use case, which is the open APS, and we're working on aerospace right now. So we're starting to bring up that. And the idea is these are interacting with these other groups inside ELISA, one of which here is the systems group. And then there's also a tooling group. And so this, the engineering process group is looking at how to work with the Linux processes, safety architectures, the subsystems in the Linux kernel. The features are all the configs. How do you actually config things? How do you build it? And then the tooling is we have a CI flow that's continually building our reference systems. And the systems is actually helping to design this reference systems with the components of Zen and Zephyr together with the Linux kernel, together with some of the AGL applications. So we can have things that people can plug and play into and then we can test out some of the requirement stuff. So the system working group is the one I wanna talk about today because this is what the piece that we finally figured out was missing. 
which is we wanted to basically put Linux in context and start to do the system level analysis. That was, me that was missing. People didn't, you know, people were fixated on Linux, the box, and understanding when you build it, you're building it a whole bunch of things, but certain requirements when you're building a system mean that certain things are important, things that other aren't, aren't important. And so what, Elise, what we're trying to do with this group is be able to have something with, that we can publicly talk about and so we can explain the definitions and how we can actually uh, come up with processes and recommendations on how to do things in a way that the assessors will find useful so that we can start to look at the analysis of if you're using Linux for this system, is it safe and if it's not, and what could go wrong and then how can you re remediate it effectively? Like you need to put something in on the side to watchdog to make sure it hasn't crashed on you, to potentially do a reboot. You know, th things go wrong and can you recover? Um, and is it important for you to recover? Do you just reboot and reset? Sometimes that's fine. It just depends on what functionality you're trying to do at what criticality level. So what we're doing is those other working groups are participating in this. And we've got this rough model where we're basically using Yocto as our tooling infrastructure around everything. And then on a set of hardware, uh, we started off with the AGL boards from Renaissance and uh, working with um, Stefano from the Zen Project. Uh, we, have, we had a, a basic reference. We're trying to move it over to some other hardware options right now. Um, and then also look at putting different applications with safety functions so we can start to move it down into that. But we've got basically the Linux um, and then we are potentially looking towards containerization with this as well. But this has been putting into our CI flow and so we are building it every, you know, we're building it on a periodic basis and whenever changes happen and we're trying to make it available so that this is the framework we're going to use to do that, to figure out paths for doing system analysis when Linux is part of it. And so that we can basically make it visible and public to people and so people can quite frankly throw rocks at it because that's how we're gonna learn. Um, it's, it's at this point in time, everything is mostly done behind NDAs and in silos, in, in, inside companies. And so we don't really have a way of understanding what group consensus, what, what really works. And so we're hoping by having something up there that people can throw rocks at we can figure out processes so that people can talk about what works, what doesn't in a neutral way and not be worrying about NDAs. And so that we can actually collaborate on figuring out how to make this useful for everyone. Because it is such a big beast, as you see. It is, um, we need to come up with strategies for approaching it. We're also uh, very much planning on working with, like you say, the other projects which you're seeing here. And we're also looking and working with pretty um, closely with the automotive green links people. Um, so, uh, Philip Amman from Bosch is engaged in the SOFI and the SDD of Eclipse things as well. So we're working out with these other communities because they've got the same problems. This, th this problem hasn't been solved by the industry yet. And we want a place where we can have do things in the open so we can try to find a solution. That is the goal of this. And, you know, uh, Philip likes to say, you know, if you've got an apple and I have an apple and we exchange, we each have an apple. But if you have an idea and, and you have an idea and we exchange the ideas, we both have two ideas. So we want to try to basically reach out and make sure that we can figure out what these ideas are that might work and then basically have them documented and have people evolve the technology here. And then the last sort of piece on this, uh, of this system that we're looking towards is Yocto. And Yocto isn't a distro, but it lets you create distros. And one of the nice things is it's a cross-compiler, which makes it, it builds a cross-compiler. So it makes it very good for working um, with things that are safety critical because to a large extent, having the compiler is one of the elements that could go wrong if you're building a safety critical system and most of the standards are looking for it. So Yocto already is doing this and Yocto is also able to quite frankly generate S-bombs and do fully reproducible builds. So that, those, th those criteria are sort of met today by this and um, it's being used by a wide range of embedded platforms already today and it's maintained by a highly skilled set of people. So it's there, it's being used. Um, it's probably the number one way that people are working on creating products with Linux today in the ecosystem. So having this as part of the equation is, um, I think, a key factor too. So that, those are the pieces we're looking at. Um, today, 
they've got the reproducible binaries. Yocto supports um, the SPXS bomb generation. The system view, though, it's done by a master index. So they have all these S bombs and they just put a master index on it. They don't actually link it together in a product line bomb. And so they're working, and so the Yocto project has been working very closely with the SPDX project on the build profile. And um, we'll be seeing when the SPX3 comes out, they'll be ready for generating out these product line bombs where they've put all the pieces together. And they're doing a lot of work as well with, um, they'd like to get more help actually, linking up the p-test results for some of the components. They've got a lot of test data that's being generated for coverage and for quality, and it's not really been linked up. So the question becomes is, okay, how does one start looking at, you know, understanding if something changes, is it still good or not? Are the requirements satisfied when the requirements are not written down? So this is a boff. What else is out there? What are we not thinking about? Do people have ideas here on how we can get things better? You know, are there other open source projects we should try to bring into part of an argumentation aspect? Does anyone have questions? That also works too. Yeah. Go for it. Oops, we've got one. Uh, hi. Uh, actually, I, it's not a simple question, but um, can we say that this gen is the better or best solution for the virtualization? I mean, uh, for partitioning as a safety application. So, uh, we actually, I'm researching it for a while, but uh, it's it's very difficult because uh, there are lots of the decision criteria for uh, deciding uh, what the solution is the best. Uh, for example, we can think about the, like a, as a computer uh, KVM or another solution for the uh, virtualization like uh, containers. So have you ever uh, researched before or any, yeah, there is lots of the, the research results in the paper, but I, I'm not sure about that, so. Yeah, um, great question. So I think with Zen, it's been around for over 20 years, and Zen is known for its safety and security features. Again, I can't comment specifically without knowing the technical specifications of the projects or the research that you're working on, but with Zen as a hypervisor, we have um, because of the isolated VMs, if anything, you know, were to happen, it's in isolation and the safety and security aspects of it is what Zen is known for. So, you know, for an example, one of our board, uh, one of our project members, they are working on getting Zen safety certified. So that's more automotive, but it doesn't mean it can't apply to things like aviation with things such as the misery, misery rules. Um, that's already a step in the right direction in terms of things like security. Um, again, to your specific example, I think, you know, there needs to be probably a wider conversation in terms of the context that you're referring to. Um, but I would definitely say um, Sen is one of the key hypervisors out there um, that's known for its robust features. Hi. Um, so first, a comment. Uh, I mean, Zen is very close to my heart because back, like long time ago when I was in the academia, uh, Zen, the, the Zen paper, it was given to me as part of my qualifying exam, PhD qualifying exam, and I had <laughs> nice, like nice. nightmares <laughs> uh, studying that because, uh, yeah, our, our systems, t, uh, like professors are super hard, <laughs> so I had to study a lot. So anyway, so that, that's, my question is about, like from a tool builder's perspective, uh, you mentioned about the Misra certification. Have you identified like how much effort is needed or like, basically I'm just curious about for a project like Zen, mm -hmm. which is pretty mature, which doesn't have Misra C compliance, how much effort is needed to make it Misra C compliant? Uh, oh, I think that question is kind of a bit like, how long is a piece of string? Um, sometimes <laughs> with code, um, you know, a bug is a bug sometimes and because the, the history of the Zen project has been around for so long, it will take time to um, adhere to those mystery uh, rules. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah and you had some of the stats, and so they've, 
they're taking a very intelligent approach to it. I sit on the safety committee for the Zen, which is why I know these <laughs> details. But um, one of the things they, they did is they basically had training on Ms. C for all the maintainers. And that training basically made the maintainers understand what the Ms. River Girls are trying to do is reduce variability, which is improving quality and predictability. And they got it then. And so rule by rule, um, they are moving the code base forward to be compliant in a structured fashion. So more mm -hmm. rules are being added each time and it's being done, you know, release by release. And so they're doing grouping of rules. Um, the Zephyr community tried to um, move to Missouri. We tried with the, uh, sort of the LTS version, but realistically we have to do things upstream the way Zen's doing it, I think. And so we're going to be in Zephyr trying to uh, start looking at adopting things rule by rule and making sure that the TSC is happy with that then before they get applied and then try to get the, the code base coherent that way too for us. Yeah. And in terms of the Linux kernel, I don't think that's gonna happen in the near future, okay? <laughs> if <Thank> ever. <laughs> but anyhow, so yeah, so that's kind of, um, that's sort of what's been happening there. Sure, thank you. And uh, for the record, I passed the qualifier and I've got my PhD, thank you. <laughs> So we got one over here. Yes, yeah, thank you. I'm using Zen as well, very, very well, especially if it's once on an RMV8 architecture, it's very great. Uh, but my question or adding I would take is, I noticed that especially the bootloader is very important for security critical booting of Zen, and my question is, do you implement that in your concept as well? We have not put a, chosen a, a bootloader in the code set right now. Um, we want someone from one of the bootloader communities to come mm. work with us. If someone comes to work with it, we'll ask what will happen. Okay, because there are many, many things you have considered to make that secure. Very much so. Yeah, that's the thing. Especially when you're talking about booting up into secure enclaves mm. and things like that. Exactly. So yeah, no, we definitely, it's a part, but what we're trying to do is get something that we can plug and play into. And if okay. there's you know, people with interest in bootloading, in the bootloading paths, in the secure bootloading paths, if they want to come in and pre-instantiate some stuff for us, we'll work it into the framework. Great. Uh, so the same applies for me to Kubernetes or Docker container running on mm -hmm. the SVM as well. Yeah, that's why we're talking to like the Sophie folk, because um, they're very much focused on that part of the problem. And so, you know, it's not completely unheard of at some point in time, we may try to get certain things working all together as well there. Um, and I don't know if Walt has thoughts about the um, application layer and making, because I know AGL is aiming in some of that direction too, I believe right now too. What? At the top, at the application, abstracting the hardware layer that Dan was talking about yesterday. Mostly with Vert.io. Yes, thank you. Okay. So it's mostly with Vert.io, which is mostly what Sophie's doing too, I believe. So we're using Vert.io for the abstractions. Any other questions? Oops, there's a few more in the back, okay. Yes, hello together. My name is Alfred Bayer from AVL Soft and Functions and, uh, and I understood that this is somehow a generic approach, right? That we, that you set the base which can be used for any kind of projects. So my question would be, so which AC level uh, do you target and, uh, and, yeah, and, how, and how can you ensure that, that the users get the mature base because open source, it's not so easy, right, to, so the, yeah, so to open deliver source, this. And, uh, everything is shifting sound. So what we're trying to figure out is rather than lock it down to one mature base or one perfect base, what processes should you go through to make sure you've got confidence in your base? Mm. Uh, which is not exactly the idea that people want to hear, um, but I don't think anything else really scales. I think there's commercial organizations that will give you a solid base, but I don't think the upstream projects can, and certainly putting things in reference. So the best we can come up with at this point in time is to do the processes for, this is what you should have, these are your checklists to make sure that things are um, configured properly, structured properly, so that we know the behaviors and we have the things qualified. Uh, not the ideal answer, I agree. Um, but 
what's out there, at least it, hopefully it's a step forward, and maybe someone will come up with a better idea after we move it a little bit forward, but at least it will give people a way of talking without NDAs. And right now, um, we've had many, we've had about 10 to, 10 to 15 years of people trying to deal with safety uh, within these constrained NDAs, and they talk with only in their own company, and everything is for trade secret. No one can talk to any other. So while this is just a skeleton, at least it's something that people can build off and swap pieces in and out. So we're trying to use modularity and we're trying to basically surface up enough requirements so you can say, oh, I'm building this system. This is how this is participating this way. And so that you can put different applications on the top that are using these parts. Um, you know, it's a different argumentation for level depending on what the criticality is for in terms of life. You know, there's a scale here. Um, I think in the aerospace, we're sort of working to get into the quality side <laughs> from some of their scales. And in the automotive, probably we're around the same place right now, quality going forward a little bit, depending on which pieces of code have which safety functions, like what functions have been allocated to which pieces of it is also pretty key. And that means the system, you need to know what you're hooking it, starting it with, because certain requirements take effect when certain things happen. Like your requirements for an EV charging system are we going quite different from your requirements for a drivetrain on a car, right? And potentially they could all both be using Linux. So we have to figure out processes here. I think that's what it's going to come down to. Okay. Do you have any other thoughts here or do you disagree uh, completely with I mean, me? It, it, it's, it's in general a, a super difficult uh, approach, right? So I mean, yeah. I, I know the world also from uh, from classic projects, not, not open source, and even here it's super difficult to reach ACLD, right? Oh, yeah. uh, everything process compliant as, as uh, And so, as like, you know, said. some of the things are some of the higher ACLD exactly. you know, and Me so forth. So, like, things like the RTOS or things like no. Zen no. may be able to be part of that when putting the safety side of it there. No. And the Linux stuff not have that safety criticality. It's doing your infotainment system, but it doesn't have, like, you know, some of the other things no. that are there. So, the partitioning is going to be key. Mm. And there'll be other open source projects participating in this type of event uh, in infrastructure, some of which may be safety critical. Like there are um, some other open source kernels that have gone through formal verification that may be important for play for certain, from certain pop, you know, in certain functionality. Um, I'm thinking the cell four kernel has some aspects that may be necessary for some of these higher levels because they have the full formalization already there. But uh, on the other hand, if you're talking with Bluetooth, you may want to use something like Zephyr. Um, because it can, you know, it's done enough to basically handle the requirements. Mm. So, we, and the trouble is, we don't have a discipline in open source of documenting the requirements as things get added in. Uh, there's always a good reason, which is effectively a requirement, but that, unless you're mining your history of commits and so forth and trying to re reverse engineer it, we don't have those access to that. And so figuring out methodologies to say, okay, if I'm using this function, this is a requirement for it to be considered to be working. You know, th that's part of why you're seeing focus on requirements coming from both Zen and Zephyr right now and in terms of, okay, how can we surface some of this stuff up so we can know we're, we know we're done and we can do system engineering properly when these things are part of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, super. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Another question? Okay, another thought? <laughs> Oops. Oh, we're, we're being told we have to stop. But go ahead. He, he says we can do one more question. Thank you. So, I guess building off of your comment about like tracing back code to the requirement, uh -huh. like it's the ultimate dream that like you can automate like the CI and have like some kind of like conformance that is actually yep. going to be doing the verification for you and will be yes. trying to penetrate to make sure that you are actually doing what you say you're going to do. That is the dream. That is why we want to have the tests. That's why we're actually working with the SPDX community to basically use the relationships and create knowledge graphs so that we can reason about things and build up from there. If we can't automate this, we can't keep up with the scale of vulnerability fixes, and that's going to be key. So if we're, if we're basically, yeah, we want to go there. So <laughs> help is welcome, definitely. Okay. Well, well thank you. Oops. I think we've been told we have to stop and yeah. come catch us afterwards. And yeah, thank you very, <laughs> thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Yeah, thank you. And. Uh,